guys, welcome today as we prepare to jump into our study on the Gospel of John. Uh, this is Brian Sumner, the host of the Foolishness Podcast, of which I've been putting out for the past few years now. I'm interviewing many guests, putting out teachings and various sermons, you know, whether at my home church or as I travel. And if you're new to joining me, this is not an accent. I'm actually from England, so I am speaking not original, but some kind of English. Amen. You guys are probably the ones with the accent trying to speak English. Um, but I've been residing in Huntington Beach, California for the last two decades, having emigrated here years ago to be a professional skateboarder for Tony Hawk's Birdhouse, but not being raised in the faith and having no clue about life. I was married, had a son, was on the top of my skate career, making great money, had no clue about God. I was divorced search for truth, eventually came to faith, witnessed to my ex, who then came to faith. We were remarried, and we went on to have two more children, praise God. And this was all around, you know, 2004. And why this is important is because since coming to faith, I was just thrown out there onto this stage of events, all kinds of outreaches and places to share our story, and of course, the gospel. Why this is important and why it speaks into today is because as I've been traveling over all those years, being raised in Liverpool, traveling the world as a professional skateboarder, I am now part of this big jujitsu community and all these other things I'm involved in, up and down you know, the West Coast, across America, around the world, many people in ministry. What that means is I've encountered so many people that tune into what I'm doing, but may not be planted in a church or may not even own a Bible. The amount of people I get messages from per week who are like, I love the podcast or I caught this sermon or I caught this and I ask them, where do you live? Where do you go to church? Um, do you have a Bible? And the amount who say, no, I don't. And so with that, I thought, why don't I just jump into the Gospel of John? prayed about it, Lord, why don't we just start studying through the gospel of John? So maybe some of you who are listening now is who I'm talking to. You're on your drive to work. You don't want to be in church or you're going through crisis in your life and you're going to hear out of the Bible today. And the goal, I'm not trying to spring this on you, but the goal is that you would see the beauty of the scriptures, the beauty of Jesus and get back involved in real church, face-to-face ministry around other believers. Get a Bible for yourself and really begin to walk out your faith. I say that because this isn't to fulfill the role of a church or to make you not go to a church and this is where you get ministered to. This is just a podcast. And so with that, Let's jump in. And so as we get into this, we should be asking ourselves, why John? Why the Gospel of John? And you could even be saying, Brian, why are there four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Why not have just one? Well, for one, each of these is writing from a certain perspective, a certain mindset, a certain group of people. And though we can read them all and they all do apply, they are all spirit-filled and ordained by God, God overseeing them, you have to realize that Matthew's writing to the Jews. Matthew's writing to the nation of Israel, which is why he says things like, so that it may be fulfilled, meaning all the prophecies you've heard from hundreds of years ago, all the things you've grown up talking about and hearing through your parents, they are being fulfilled through Jesus and will be being fulfilled to the end of time. Mark's gospel, which is generally agreed to be the earliest gospel written, is a way shorter and more direct and action-packed gospel written to the Romans to communicate specifics. And Luke's gospel, Luke's gospel is written with a Greek audience in mind, Luke himself being a Gentile and presenting Jesus as the son of man presenting him perfect as he is, but also because the Greeks themselves, they put such a high focus on how we carry ourselves. Luke presents Jesus heavily as this compassionate and loving man. And these three are all known as the synoptic gospels because they are similar in pattern and contain many of the same stories and sequences of events. Whereas John is written with the focus on the divinity of Christ, which for where we are in the world with all these false religions, this new ageism, uh, the worship of the universe, and so many openly occult practices, it would be smart for people nowadays to actually stop, 
read John's gospel and consider exactly what it is that God wants all of us to know about Jesus. Also, to start, we got to think they weren't known as the gospels. They would be known as according to John or according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, meaning according to those who walk with Jesus, according to those who recorded these things, this is their truth about Jesus' truth, which is the gospel. And although John never mentions his own name, he does famously refer to himself as what? As many of you have heard. The disciple whom Jesus loved, which yes, it can sound kind of prideful. You're saying you're the disciple that Jesus loved, but by not mentioning his name, there's a humility. But also by telling us he's the disciple that Jesus loved. Let me ask you, do you believe that? In the midst of your day, in the midst of your life, in the midst of all that is going on as you are hearing this podcast, are you the disciple that Jesus loves? Did God so love the world to go to the cross for you and me, proving to us that he loves us? Because if you've confessed him as Lord, if you've been born again, you should be living with the boldness that we hear from John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all point to John, by name, placing him at these significant events, these significant encounters, telling us that this is John. And people also would have known all about John as he wasn't martyred earlier like the rest of the apostles, but lived a longer life and in many ways was an overseer and also sort of a a grandfather apostle. And guys, John has this amazing resume. He gives us this gospel. He gives us 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. He gives us the book of Revelation. He was one of the sons of Zebedee, called by Jesus personally, named by Jesus as one of the sons of thunder. And he was also one of Jesus' closest three. Alongside Peter and James, because Jesus, as with any rabbi, would have normally had three that were set apart, three prominent students to oversee his teachings or yoke as it was known, so as to continue his teachings when he passed. Peter, James, and John were also there on the Mount of Transfiguration when Moses and Elijah showed up. God himself showed up. They were also there in the Garden of Gethsemane as he prepared himself for the cross. So we see that John had this close relationship with Jesus. He laid his head on the chest of Jesus at the Last Supper. He was there at the cross where Jesus even entrusted his mother to John. And after Jesus ascended into heaven, John became a pillar in the early church in Jerusalem. Alongside Jesus' own brother, James the Just, and he even served alongside Peter for many years before John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, giving us the book of Revelation. Many believe that John's gospel was written so late because John would have been familiar with these other gospels in circulation. He would have been familiar of other people having heard from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So he would have seen the rise of these false doctrines, these satanic ideas that opposed Jesus as God or said he was only man. This idea that when he walked in the sand, there was no footprint, meaning he was some kind of spiritual being or the idea that he was only a man and he wasn't divine. And as we get into this gospel, we have to say, well, John or the Holy Spirit, God, Jesus, why are we given this gospel? And in John 20 and 31, we're told, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. These things are written The text is given. I am reading this today that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. John's goal was to present Jesus as he is to them and to us as God in the flesh. This prophesied Messiah, not only man, but fully God, showing us that Jesus alone is who could live, die, and resurrect so we could freely believe and have eternal life. And so, yes, as you can see, I'm going to dig deep into these studies. I want people joining to realize for the first time just how much we can know about these historic documents, just how much has been passed through church tradition, that we're not just blindly believing, but there's so much evidence historically, geographically, and of course, through God's anointed word. And so with that, here's John 1. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him. Was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, and he came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I have said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. So John starts off with, In the beginning. And now why would John start with this? Even some of you who may not be believers are those who barely know any scripture. But if there's one verse that you may have heard before, it may be this one verse, because John is taking the listeners way back to where? Genesis. Genesis 1-1 where we read, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. See, Matthew started his gospel, tracing Jesus' genealogy all the way back to who? Abraham because he was speaking to the Jews. And Luke goes all the way back to Adam, before Abraham, speaking to the Greeks about mankind in general. But John, John wants to go all the way back to where? Not Abraham, not Adam, but to the very beginning, tracing Jesus back to God himself. Back to God way before the universe itself was created. Which, by the way, Though many people today do worship the universe or aim to speak to it and manifest it, universe means single sentence. The uni, single, the verse, sentence. So while people are worshiping that which is created, they're being deceived rather than worshiping the creator himself. And as John says in the beginning, he's talking about before all that we understand to exist ever existing meaning time and space and matter, all that science and theory aims to understand and determine. And if we go all the way back to the beginning, who do we find there? Only God. It's only God, and this is how John's readers would have understood this, being familiar with the Hebrew Bible, being raised believing that God is the author of life. And here is John Having these Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, you're starting us with what? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And remember now that all sorts of Gnostic teaching and heretical ideas by now had infiltrated society about who Jesus was. He was just a spiritual teacher. He was just some sort of Gnostic sage. We're in, like all these other cults and false religions today. They'll accept your version of Jesus, but I don't want him to be God. I don't want him to be deity. I don't want him to have offered a sacrifice. I don't want him to be the way, the truth, and the life. But some other variation, I'll take that, Jesus. John says, no. In the beginning was the word. And when we hear this word today, what do you think of? When I talk about Jesus being the word of God, what comes to mind? Because if you were raised in the faith, you probably think, well, Jesus is the word, and that's true. But again, John is taking this all the way back to the Old Testament, how God spoke and how his word brought forth creation. How in Genesis 1-3 we read, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. That as God was speaking, creating plants, animals, birds, and trees, his word was going out. Creation was unfolding, and we see this theme throughout the Old Testament. Psalm 33, 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. Psalm 107, 20. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Proverbs eight twenty seven. 
When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of man. How radical that these verses talk as though God was speaking about who was with him, present at work, but also God. It's almost as if John is referring to the word as what? A person. And that's exactly how they would have understood this. See, for them, the Jews, they would have been familiar with the story of Moses, the story of the burning bush, where God shows up and Moses asks God in Exodus 3.13, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. I am who I am. That's the response that God gave to Moses, meaning before you worry about my name, lining me up with all these other names, before I am just some title, some false god that Pharaoh worships like Baal, Osiris, Ra, Isis, Anubis, any other gods people try to call upon, before all of this mumbo jumbo, Moses, know that I am. And do we really get this? I am. Moses, I have always been, I am the eternal, but Moses, you are just a shepherd, you were created. Even Pharaoh and all that he's pouring out right now, controlling and enslaving Israel, Pharaoh's just a man. Even Egypt, all that's taken place, all that's created, even the burning bush, but Moses, I am. Can you guys think of a better response than that? That God is saying, I am, I am the always, I am the eternal, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever, who was and is to come. Everything else Moses was created, but I am. And why this is amazing, because as you know, when people aim to speak about what's taking place in the burning bush, they wouldn't dare usher God's name. You couldn't find a Jew today who would try to speak God's name out loud. In fact, they took the vowels out of the very word, making it the tetragrammaton, missing the vowels, so that people couldn't repeat God's name. People couldn't try to use his name to take power, to take control over something. And so let me ask us, what would they say? Well, they would refer to God as Adonai or Hashem. Hashem meaning the name, the name who spoke to Moses in the bush or Adonai. But later when the rabbis and scholars would refer to God's moving or being at work, like in ancient writings like the Targum, they would write down this reference to God at work. And you know what they would write? They would write Memra, M-E-M-R-A, which when translated, you know what it says? The word or even the speech. They wouldn't say God's name. They'd say Adonai or Hashem. But in writing, they would write Memra, meaning that they would have understood exactly what John was saying when he says, in the beginning was the word. So we have this clearly Jewish understanding of the word even back then. And here is John using this idea to point to Jesus' divinity. Why am I saying all of this? Because John's gospel is written to affirm Jesus is divine, proving that the Old Testament speaks of this coming Savior, Messiah, the Word of God, to be Jesus. And what should this do if we want to get serious? It just causes us to ask ourselves, how did Jesus himself use the term, I am? One of my favorite passages in all of Scripture is when Judas has betrayed Jesus and a band of soldiers and officers come to capture Jesus and Jesus takes control. That they're in the garden, they're coming to capture Jesus. And John 18, 4, listen to this. 
Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. Jesus is saying, I am, and note in the Greek, it does not say, I am he. It simply reads, I am, and it says in verse 6, when Jesus says this, what took place? They fell over. Grown men, adults, fell to the floor because he said, I am. And you may have seen the Benny Hinn videos. You may have seen the Versace coats and people going flying and prayer circles where people are being pushed over and breathed upon and all the rest. That's not what's happening. They have come to Jesus to arrest him who has been betrayed. And he tells them, I am he. And they fall over. This has never happened to anyone else. Go into Starbucks today. When they ask for your name, tell them your name. No one has fallen over. But when Jesus says, I am, they fell over. And can I tell you that Jesus refers to himself again and again and again in the text as the I am. Remember now. We're in the Gospel of John with the goal of showing the divinity of Christ as God in the flesh. And throughout the New Testament, the famous seven I am's of Jesus, what does he say? I am the bread sent from heaven. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the true vine. I am the resurrection. Even when Philip said, show us the Father and it will suffice, Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And even when he was challenged in John 8, 58 to 59, truly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Before Abraham, I am. Placing himself way back there and notice, even if they're wanting to stone him, this shows that they understood that he was referring to himself as God in the flesh. He was going back to the story of the burning bush, which they believed to be blasphemous. This tells us the Jews of that day understood he claimed to be God. We see him have these experiences with the demonic, where those demons knew who he was. And what this should do for us is as Jesus shows up in the New Testament and we read these verses, we should see God's glory in the Old Testament fulfilled in the person of Jesus. What do I mean? Well, think back to Exodus 33.20. Think back to when God is rescuing the nation of Israel after 400 years of bondage to the Pharaoh. And you have Moses. Moses, who has experienced so many things, he's walked with God, he's seen the ten plagues, he's seen the sea parted, the water come from the rock, he's had the burning bush. But what is his desire? To see the glory of the Lord. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says, God speaking to Moses, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. Because man could not stand before God as he appeared and survived. And so in the Old Testament, we see God appearing often hidden within a cloud. Exodus 24, 16, the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai for six days. The cloud covered the mountain. Exodus 40, 34, the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Second Chronicles 5, 14, the house of the Lord was filled with the cloud so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Over 150 references to the glory over and over. God reveals himself by his glory. Even in the Holy of Holies, once a year on the Day of Atonement, was the high priest allowed to enter behind the veil, standing before the presence of God. But what did he have tied amidst his ankle? A rope, because if he fell down and died, the others would have to pull him out of there. But all of this changed with Christ. What do I mean? The New Testament Colossians 1.15 reads, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven, on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, 
All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. There's the word of God, Jesus. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. Hebrews 1.3 The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. And in John 8.12 I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So just like in the Old Testament, they were led by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, representing God as light. Or considering the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus was physically transformed along with Moses and Elijah, we read in Matthew 17 too, consider this. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. Even when God shows up in verse 5, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my Son whom I love. Guys, they have just encountered Christ glorified before them. That's why we will read a few verses later in our study in John, We beheld His glory. And see, what we have to understand about this idea of Jesus being the Word of God is that what we see of Jesus in the New Testament is the Word of God personified. Meaning you are seeing the Word of God as a person walking amidst us. But what do we see in the Old Testament? We are seeing him spoken about, the Word of God textualized. Meaning he's being prophesied and talked about, textualized, but the New Testament is his arrival. And I personally believe Jesus did show up in the Old Testament, what's known as a Christophany. This time God shows up and they call it a theophany, but scholars would talk about a Christophany where he is present in many ways. See, you have to realize that 2,000 years Jesus showed up as God in the flesh, incarnate, walked amongst us, was born of a virgin through Mary, fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah 700 years prior. But in the Old Testament, Jesus could have walked anywhere he wanted. He existed prior to Satan, prior to the fall of man. He has always been. And so as John goes on in John 1, 1, what does he say? He says, the word was with God and the word was God. And the way we just talked about that word memra, this is the same way that the Greeks use the word logos, which many of you are familiar with. Why this is amazing for Greeks and how they viewed the world from a very scientific perspective, and science doesn't go against the Bible at all, God spoke it all. But to the Greeks, they look at the world and they say, there's order, there's construction, there's design. Something took place to birth all of this. We see the sun and the moon. We see the seasons. We see nature. We see species after its own species. There is a pattern. And while they didn't fully understand it all, they agreed as the even scientists today that something or someone spoke did something, there was a bang, there was something that took place that brought about order. So when John is saying the word, the logos, what he's telling the Greeks is, Jesus is the one who brought the spark. Jesus is the one that did all of this. And even here when he says, and the word was God, this really is so significant. As Christians, we can read this so easily and overlook it and miss it. To say that the word is God, let me ask you this. If you were to tell your Mormon friend, your Jehovah Witness friend, your Muslim friend, your New Age friend, your atheist friend, that the word is God, if you were to tell them that Jesus is God, would they agree with you? No. Because to the Mormon, Jesus and Satan are brothers, simple. They view Jesus as on the same level as his supposed brother Satan, yet we only need to look at the text to disprove these things. Colossians 1.16 says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, 
Where does Satan roam? Well, in the heavens before being cast out. And so on the earth, we're told he goes to and fro upon the face of the earth like a roaring lion seeking to devour. So we're trying to be told that Jesus and Satan are brothers, yet we're told here that Jesus created everything. And the Bible even tells us in Genesis 3, 1, that the serpent was more crafty than the other beasts of the field that the Lord God had made. And so if Jesus created all things while the serpent was created, can they be brothers? No. And if your idea of the serpent is even as an actual serpent slithering around, you have to remember that prior to the fall, to the curse, to Satan's pride, to Adam and Eve fallen, the serpent operated differently because part of his curse was that now he would slither along the ground. Jesus and Satan are not brothers. And then even for the Jehovah Witnesses, they don't believe Jesus and Satan are brothers. They believe Jesus is Michael the Archangel and that Jesus is not God, but just a God, which again, if you read in the Greek, it does not read a God. So when the Jehovah Witnesses show up to your door, go get your Greek Bible, have them bring out their new world translation and ask them to show you in the Greek where it says that Jesus was a God and they won't be able to. If you ask them to tell you who translated your translation, no one owns it. No one's name is put to it. They all deny it. There's no translation in history that translates it with Jesus as a God. Where does it come from? Showed up out of thin air. And who is the spirit prince of the air? Again, it's Satan. And aside for this, what's amazing, one of, again, my favorite passages in scripture is Jesus is resurrected and shows up to the disciples and doubting Thomas is there in disbelief, basically saying, I need to see this for myself. And as Jesus shows up, what takes place in John 20 and 27? And Jesus said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So Thomas has been assured that this is the resurrected Christ. This is Jesus who was on the cross looking at the very marks that he took for you and me. But note in this verse, and I bring this up all the time at Jehovah Witnesses, what did Thomas call Jesus? He said, my Lord, Ikarios, and my God, Theos. Thomas just called Jesus Lord and God. And what is Jesus' response? Now would be a great time to rebuke him and say, whoa, don't worship me. But Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Blessed are you, Thomas, for believing this. God has opened your eyes. But blessed are those who have not done this, not seen yet. You and me, all believers. Jesus is telling us that he is not an angel because no angel will ever ask man to bow down and worship him. Aside from who? Satan himself. The devil. The devil wants your worship. Satan wants your worship. The serpent, the father of lies, wants your worship. In fact, he doesn't even need you to worship him. He just wants us to worship ourselves. What does he do when Jesus is full of the Spirit and led out to be tempted and challenged by Satan? We see that in Matthew 4, 9, he asks Jesus to fall down and worship him. So, Jesus is not Michael the archangel. He's God in the flesh. And even for Muslims who believe that it was Judas who was on the cross and not Jesus, that Jesus is simply a prophet, the dangerous thing with these mindsets, much like the New Ages, much like the spiritual practices, is again, they will take any version of Jesus, but just not the one who lived, died, resurrected. Not the one who has told us we are sinners and need to be forgiven. Not the one who hung up on that cross in our place, cursed, shedding his blood for us, who clearly tells us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Or that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. And see, only through Jesus can mankind be forgiven. 
Because we're in the midst of this cosmic battle wherein the serpent and his minions have blinded the minds of unbelievers. What the fallen ones have done is birthed a multitude of false religions, false paths, false roads of coexisting, accepting everyone and anyone's truth, when in reality, only one came because God so loved the world, fully God, wrapped in the flesh, to hang up on that cross for all those who would call upon his name and be forgiven. Guys, only Jesus took our place, and I hope that you understand that. That whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever you have done, no matter how radical, nothing is more powerful than the blood of Jesus. And his blood can wipe away every sin as we are born into God's family and sealed with the Spirit of God. I respect all people. I respect their opinion. But I'm not going to follow or bow down to your false gods i'm going to pray and believe and preach the truth so that people's eyes and ears and hearts can be opened as they are born again and so this brings us to where we are today let me ask you if you were to drop dead today where do you go we are a breath away from heaven with god or an eternity separated from him in what the bible refers to as hell the Bible says today's the day of salvation. Tomorrow is promised no one. And you might say, well, Brian, I think I'm good enough to go to heaven. The Bible says none are good. Or one lie or one lustful thought or blasphemous life. Me growing up in England couldn't care less about God. Touring the world as a skateboarder. Living however I wanted to. Even getting married, having no clue about what marriage really was. I know I sinned. I'm sure you've struggled with some kind of sin. And James says if we've sinned one time, we're guilty of the law. And what that means is because of our sin, the payment we receive is death. Are you going to die? All of us will. It's a point of man to die once and then judgment. There's no reincarnation. The second we die, we stand before the Lord and we're pronounced innocent or guilty. And John 3.18 actually says that those who haven't confessed, those who don't believe in Jesus are already condemned. So God has been on a rescue mission, sending his son, that as many hear his voice, as many as respond to the good news of the gospel, who repent and believe and trust that he took our sins upon himself on the cross 2000 years ago and is alive today, that our sins were nailed to it and we can freely be forgiven because God is a loving God, full of grace and mercy, and you can trust in him even today. For me, almost 20 years ago in a room just off to my right, realizing my need for forgiveness, understanding I was a sinner, thank you God for reconciling my marriage and blessing me with two more kids, but really, it was seeing my guilt, my shame, Lord, what can I do? I can't do anything. I'm not good enough, I can't be perfect enough. You know who is perfect? only Jesus. What can wash away our sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So for you, in hearing today, in hearing me talk, do you hear God's voice? Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, when he visited Jesus by night, implying that he understood who Jesus was, Jesus said, you can't understand and see these things unless you were born again. See, we are born into this world once in the flesh through our mothers, but we need to be born again by the Spirit. So when we hear of our sin, hear of our need, hear of what Jesus did on the cross and is alive today, does our heart get pricked? Do we feel the presence of the Holy Spirit convicting us, the goodness of the Lord leading us to repentance? And do we say, Lord, I bring all these sins. I ask for forgiveness. I trust in you because you can do that wherever you are. If you hear his voice as his word has gone out, it doesn't return void. As you respond, trust and believe, God does a work in us, seals us with the Holy Spirit and begins this journey with us. Let me pray. And Lord, we just thank you for today, for your word, for even technology, using a podcast or YouTube or whatever. I pray that people heard your voice, that people respond, that people follow. And that for your followers, God, they are encouraged. And as they look around the world and this is happening and that is happening, they're saying, but God is good. God is faithful regardless of what takes place in our flesh, regardless of what we face. 
We trust in you. We ask for peace and we follow you, Lord. God, I pray for your people. As they go, they will proclaim your name. They would lift you up. They would stand for the truth in a darkened world. We thank you, God, for grace and mercy, for love. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, guys, this is Brian Sumner. Normally, I am out traveling, preaching, doing a lot of counseling, encouraging marriages, doing a lot of missions, all that stuff. I'm putting these things on here to encourage people. Thank you for partnering as far as with prayer or those who actually partner with me personally in the sending ministry. BrianSumner.net for more of that. Get involved with me online and connect. But Paul writes to us in 1 Corinthians 1.18 and he says, The message of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. I hope you know Jesus. I hope you have trusted his work on the cross. God bless you all. Thank you.